The Book of Kells is a 1200-year-old religious manuscript written in the medieval period. The book contains the four Gospels of the New Testament. What makes this book special is its elaborate illuminations, some of which you may have seen when looking up medieval art. In today's video, we'll be taking a deep dive into everything you need to know about the Book of Kells, from examining the artistic pages to how the book was made. We'll also look into the book's interesting history and how it made its journey to Trinity College in Ireland where it resides to this day. Before we get started, for those that haven't already and are interested in the content I make, take a moment and subscribe and tap the bell icon to stay notified of upcoming videos. If you like the video, leave a like and share the video. Now with that said, let's dive in. The Book of Kells contains the four Gospels of the New Testament. This includes the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and is based on the works of St. Jerome, who is credited as the first person to translate the Old Testament into Latin, and was completed in 405 AD, called the Vulgate. The Book of Kells contains 340 folios. A folio is a single sheet of parchment or paper that includes both the left and right side of a page, which would mean the book contains 680 pages. The measurements of the book are 330 millimeters wide, by 255 millimeters high, or 13 inches wide by 10 inches high. The folio of the Book of Kells has been rebounded multiple times, but was heavily damaged in the 19th century, when the pages were cropped and some of the illuminations and text were destroyed in the process. We'll expand on the topic of the book's rebinding later in the video. Now, let's take a look at some of the standout pages in the Book of Kells. Here we have the canon tables. These pages help you find specific passages, they even have Roman arches. Pretty cool. Next, we have the Madonna and Child, which is the oldest depiction of them found in Western Europe. I'll give you a moment to take a look. Next, we have the carpet page found on Folio 33R. It looks like a double cross. Here's another carpet page found on folio 27b that shows the four evangelists. Matthew is depicted as a winged man, Mark is a lion, Luke is a calf or a bull, and John is an eagle. I'll give you a moment to look at the page in finer detail. Next we have the portrait pages. Here's a portrait of Matthew found on folio 28v. I'll give you a second to look at the finer details. Following the portrait page, we have an introduction page for the Gospel of Matthew on Folio 29R. Here we have the intro page for the Gospel of Mark on Folio 130R. There is no portrait page of Mark. The same can be said for Luke, who is missing a portrait page, but has an intro page on Folio 188R. Next we move to folio 291V, where we can see a portrait of John. John also has an intro page for the Gospels of John on folio 292R. Here we have one of the most famous designs on the Cairo page, which is on folio 34R. It is called the Cairo page, because Chi and Rho are the first two letters of the word Christ in Greek. As you can see from its abstract forms and complex designs, the artist who made this was a master at his craft. His skills are often compared to that of a goldsmith. Now we reach our next segment, how the Book of Kells was made, and who were the people that made it. The Book of Kells was written on vellum, and may have helped it survive all this time. Vellum is made from soft calfskin, and then stretched on a wooden frame. The stretched skin is then thinned with a special curved knife, and continuously wetted and dried to get it to the right shape and thickness. In the case of the Book of Kells, over a hundred calf were killed to make the vellum. The people who created the Book of Kells were the Columban monks. Three artists are known to have created the illustrations of the Book of Kells in a writing room called a scriptorium. Each of the artist's styles is distinct enough that we can point them out. For example, the Cairo page was made by a person likened to a goldsmith with his complex designs. The second artist is known as the portrait painter, who made the portrait of Matthew, John, and Jesus. The third artist is known as the illustrator, who made figures like the four evangelists and the Madonna and Child. Here's an example of showing what looks like two different artists on the intro page to the Gospels of Matthew. You can see the work of the goldsmith artist in the main design, and what looks like the portrait artist's work in the two figures. 
Next, let's talk about the colors used in the Book of Kells and where they got the pigments to make them. White was used to paint faces and the heads of animals. They also used white to lighten other colors, like blues and greens. The color white came from gypsum, which was quite common in Ireland. The color blue was thought to be that of lapis lazuli, but recent research has shown it wasn't likely used. Instead, the blues came from indigo or woad, which came from northern Europe. The red colors likely originate from red lead or some other organic sources, maybe from a plant, it's hard to say. The pigment for a bright yellow was made from yellow arsenic sulfide. Copper green was used, but unfortunately it bled through a lot of the folios. This was due to the book being in a damp environment. The origin of colors like pink and purple was unknown for the longest time, but luckily researchers at Trinity College in Dublin cracked the case. It turns out it was lichen, which grows on trees and rocks throughout Ireland. The thing I find funny about this is that lichen has been used as a dye for parchment and textiles since the 6th century, so it was right under the nose the entire time. Now let's talk about how the text was produced in the Book of Kells, seeing as that is the majority of the book. It is thought that four major scribes wrote the book, and just like the artists with distinct styles, the scribes did as well. We can see this with one scribe, who writes only text and leaves elaborate lettering to an artist at the start of verses. Another scribe mostly used bright colors like purple, red, and yellow for the text. This scribe also has a funny quirk. When the scribe had blank space left on a page, he would fill it up by repeating the same passage over and over again, and it hints at what modern historians think, that the text of the Book of Kells is not as important as the Illuminations. Here's why. On folio 218v and folio 219r, you can see that the text on folio 219r is the same as 218v. This is a huge mistake, especially for how expensive this book was, as over 100 calf were sacrificed to make it, not to mention some important phrases were missing and lacked chapter headers. Lastly, there was very little effort to fix these mistakes, which gives us the impression that the book's main purpose was as a showpiece, where the imagery could be viewed at ceremonial events such as Easter. In my opinion, many people couldn't read in medieval times, so it's not like it mattered what the text said, as the illuminations did the job. Still, I guess you could argue that for how expensive the book was and its religious significance, you wouldn't want to have mistakes in the book. It's an interesting thing to think about. What do you guys think? Now that we have examined the book and how it was created, we can now look at its interesting history. The Book of Kells was likely written on the island of Lona in western Scotland, in a monastery that St. Columba and his 12 disciples founded in around 561 AD. This monastery was a stepping stone for converting Scotland over to Christianity. St. Columba also founded the famous Irish monasteries of Derry, Darrow, and Kells, which will be talking about Kells in just a moment, as the book's journey to Kells is pretty interesting. It involves Vikings. From around 795 AD, Vikings came to Scotland, likely searching for valuables, but other theories suggest that the Vikings may have been dealing with civil unrest or overpopulation, so it's still up in the air as why the Vikings started raiding in the first place. The Vikings landed at Leona and raided the monastery multiple times in 795, 802, 806, and 825 AD. The Viking raid in 806 AD stands out as 68 Columban monks were killed. It is thought that the Book of Kells was written just before 800 AD and that the Viking raids encouraged the monks to flee to their sister monastery at Kells in Ireland. The Book of Kells is thought to have been with them. It is unknown if the book was completed in Leona or worked on in both monasteries. Before we move on, I have an interesting artifact to show. It is a 9th century crozer head that was found in Helgo, Sweden. For those that don't know, a crozer is a staff that a bishop carries. What is interesting about this artifact and why it's in Sweden is that this artifact was part of the Viking loot that likely came from St. Columba Monastery at Leona. Pretty cool. The next mention of the Book of Kells comes from the Annals of Olaster, an Irish manuscript that was written in the late 15th century. The manuscript compiles the histories of Ireland into entries. The oldest entries go as far back as 431 AD up to 540 AD. Interestingly, in the year 1007 AD, an entry mentions that a relic belonging to St. Columba was stolen likely the Book of Kells. Here's a translation of that entry. The great gospel of Kalom Kille was wickedly stolen by night from the Western Sacracy in the great stone church of Sianus. It was the most precious object of the Western world. 
on account of the human ornamentation. This gospel was recovered after two months and twenty nights, its gold having been taken off it and with a sod over it. So what can we take away from that? It turns out that the town of Kells was previously known as Cyanus, so the Annals of Old Aster is likely referring to the Book of Kells. It mentioned elaborate ornamentation in the book, which matches up to the Book of Kells, and it's also important that before its rebinding, the book had no cover and was missing pages in the front and back of the book, almost as if the book was torn from its cover. Experts say that only around 30 folios are missing from the Book of Kells, which is pretty impressive considering it's a 1200 year old book. The cover of the Book of Kells likely had an ornamented cover with gold and jewels. It's a shame we'll never get to see it. The next mention of the Book of Kells comes from the Annals of Tigrana. Here's what it says. The Requeries of Kilomkile, the Bell of the Kings, and the Flebellum and the Two Gospels were brought out of Tyconal, together with seven score ounces of silver, and Angus o Dumahalatan, it was that brought them from the Norfolk Kells. It says that the two books of St. Columba were brought to Kells from the county of Donegal. The geographical area of Donegal was known as the Kingdom of Tyconal, established as early as the 5th century AD, so that adds up. It is thought that the Book of Kells was one of two books, and the Book of Darrow was the other, which is more than a hundred years older than the Book of Kells. The Book of Kells stayed at Kells through the Middle Ages, but the interesting part is that new additions were added to the book through the 11th to 15th centuries. Let's talk about those. In the late 11th and 12th centuries, the blank pages and spaces on folio 5V to 7V and 27R were used to record property transactions that related to the monastery at Kells. That's interesting. Never thought that one of the great relics of St. Columba would be used to record property transactions. Next in the 15th century, a poem was added on folio 289V. The poem praised the Book of Kells as the great gospel of St. Columb Kille, also known as St. Columba. Now we move ahead to the 1600s, when the Book of Kells survived the most violent conflict in Irish history. Tensions were building for the Irish Catholics since 1603, when the English took control of Ireland and oppressed the Catholics with their Protestant religion. The Irish eventually reached a boiling point and revolted in 1641. This started the Eleven Years' War from 1641 to 1652. In 1649, Ireland was invaded by Oliver Cromwell and his army, who were there on behalf of the British Parliament. Cromwell was ordered to crush the Catholics, who resisted and did just that. After the war, around 1653, the Book of Kells was sent to Dublin by the Governor of Kells, Charles Lambert, to keep it safe as the Church of Kells was seized by Cromwell's army and destroyed. A few years later, the Book of Kells made it into the hands of Henry Jones when he became a bishop. Jones was also the Vice Chancellor of Trinity College and the former Scoutmaster General to Cromwell's army. He donated the book to Trinity College in 1661. Now for our last segment, the Book of Kells' rebinding history. In 1742, the Book of Kells was rebound by John Eckshaw. He rebound the book into seven chords. The second rebinding of the Book of Kells was a total disaster. This took place in 1821 and resulted in the pages being trimmed, destroying some of the illuminations and text. The third rebinding was done in 1895, likely to fix the botched job of the previous bookbinder. Lastly is the fourth rebinding done in 1953 by Powell when he rebound the Book of Kells into four volumes to better preserve it. Now in modern times, the Book of Kells is on display at Trinity College. Two of the four volumes are shown on rotation. Well there you have it, the Book of Kells, the book that survived being stolen, Viking raids and a bloody revolution. It's crazy to think we're still able to look at its grand illuminations 1200 years later. I'm still amazed it took around 75 years to make the book. The Book of Kells also got me interested in the Book of Darrow, which is 100 years older. We will do a video on that as well in the near future. As always, thanks for watching and I'll see you guys in the next video.